And so we close the distance to where he is under 300 yards, which is still far. Uh, but I, I'm glassing and I'm still not sure it's a buck. And, and I just keep staring and he keeps moving. And there's something about, every time he moves, I'm like, there's there's something there, but it's not, it's not the normal, you, you know, you kind of get used to the picture of the deer turns its head and you see the, the rack sticking up there. And there's something besides ears moving around. And finally I catch an angle where I can see, oh my gosh, this is Elliot, the one antler deer that my wife shot at. Uh, and he's right there in the corner of the field. And unfortunately he's, he's at an angle, he's making his way to the edge where he's gonna be at the edge of the property. He's gonna hop the fence, he's gonna be off into the desert and he's gonna be gone. So, I tell Hendrick, oh man, that's that's a buck. That's Elliot. He's back. Uh, take your shot if you're ready. Welcome to Hunting Stories, brought to you by Late to the Game Outdoors. Everyone loves a good story, and hunters have some of the best. Our whole mission is to collect and share great stories from hunters just like you to entertain and keep you motivated all year long. So, pull up a seat around the campfire, because here we go. Welcome back, everybody. This is your host, Eric, from Late to the Game Outdoors with another hunting story. And this is a story of one where I did not personally have a tag. I was with my wife and my oldest son, who both had deer tags, and it is the bougiest hunt I ever take part in at any point in my hunting career. Uh, so here's the story. We, um, My wife's cousin, so my cousin-in-law, I suppose... Uh, runs a, a bunch of alfalfa farms way out in the deserts uh, outside of the Phoenix area. And he is a great guy um, and is, is always happy to let us hunt his property when we have a tag in that unit. And so, uh, n you know, 10 minutes-ish from the farm is my wife's aunt's house, which is just a wonderfully nice farmhouse. She is the most hospitable person in the world. And uh, based on how the hunting works out there, the deer basically come in at the very end of the day and they sort of just mill around the fields all night long, stuffing themselves on alfalfa and grass and whatever else they're growing at that point. And then right as the sun starts to come up, they're like, oh, we probably better get out of here. They jump the fence back into the desert and they go hide wherever they're going to hide until they come back the, that evening. So as much as I am usually a go, go, go hunt all day, I'll sit up on a hill behind my glass, maybe take a little nap, but I'll, I'll just be hunting, glassing, searching all day long. This is definitely your more traditional, we go out before dawn, we hunt the morning. If nothing happens, uh, once all the deer are gone, we hop in the truck, go back to the farmhouse, we eat a nice breakfast, we take a nap, <laughs> all that lazy stuff. Then we come back out for the evening hunt. It's absolutely my wife's way to hunt. Uh, she does not like cold. She does not love sleeping on the ground. So to stay in a nice house in a bed where you have a shower every night and you just kind of bounce out to hunt for a couple hours at a time, she's all about it. So uh, a few weeks before the hunt, uh, we were out there. I mean, my father-in-law had, had been scouting for probably a month, just hanging cams, moving cams always sending me pictures. He was out there at least a few times a week, just, just glassing and, and checking his, his cards and his cameras. Uh, and we had a lot of activity, a lot of really good bucks. And we were not even going to be picky. Like there were some monsters walking around, but if either of them had a shot at a fork, we were going to take it because, because neither of them have put an animal on the ground yet. This was my, my son has had a couple of javelina tags and we didn't put much, if any, time into them. And so nothing really happened there. My wife went on a couple hunts as a kid. Uh, she There are stories of her taking a shot, maybe a couple shots, missing by a mile. Uh, and then she went on this same hunt with, with us uh, three years ago now, I think. Um, and, and it was a weird, a lion had moved into the farm. Uh, you know, we had found a lion kill on the farm just a few weeks before hunting season. And wouldn't you know, the deer stopped coming around so much, uh, at least all the bucks just vanished. And so she never got an opportunity or a shot that year. So this year we were stoked and, and a few weeks before we got them all set up and dialed in. Uh, my wife has the same old reliable 243. She's been shooting since she was a kid. Uh, we've upgraded the optics on it since then. 
Uh, and she's, she's rock solid at the range. Super impressed. Uh, and then we got my son set up. He used to just borrow my wife's rifle because their hunts never overlap. Now that they did, I got them all set up on a, a 6.5 Creedmoor and I don't want to get into caliber debates, but I was trying to do all I could. I'm fairly recoil sensitive. I don't know that that's necessarily genetic, but I'm trying to help him not pick up bad habits that I've tried to work really hard to fight in myself. So I got him a 6.5 Creedmoor. I put a break on it. Uh, it's just the lightest shooting gun, like it feels just like an AR when you shoot it. Like, like almost nothing has happened other than it's really, really, really loud. Anyway, we got him pretty well dialed in. I mean, he was, he was in the zone, uh, but would occasionally, you know, just kind of have a flyer. Just he's, he's still dialing it in. Um, should have probably taken him a little bit more before the hunt, but life is what it is. Anyway, uh, opening day comes. Uh, it is... The very first morning, um, and nothing happens. <laughs> we we had our best laid plans. We crept up. We glassed into all these fields, and we didn't see a single deer, which is super weird. But we didn't panic because we know they've been around, and, and sometimes that just happens. It's a big farm, so you kind of just have to pick your poison. Like you you can't cover all of it with your glass in a morning. Um, even if you could, if you saw something way 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 out there. I mean, it's, it's pretty flat terrain. You'd have, it's, it's not really spot and stalk. It's much more ambush style. Like you choose the field and the spot that you think will give you the best chance. And you hope that they come within range, uh, with a little bit of opportunities to stalk in here and there if you need to. Uh, so that first morning, nothing happened, but we did see tons of hunting pressure. It, it's public land all around the farm. And so there were, were guys moving around. There were quads and Jeeps and, if you looked out into the desert on virtually every hill, there's hunters sitting up there. Uh, so we knew it was going to get kind of crazy. But fortunately, we had the farm largely to ourselves. There was one other party, friends of the family, and we just kind of stayed out of each other's way on the farm. Perfectly safe. That evening of the first night, uh, man, things got good. Shots were fired. Um, and, and we decided to kind of divide and conquer. So my father-in-law was with us. He and my wife uh, picked a field and they went off and just decided, you know what, we're usually kind of sticking to the edges of these fields, kind of hiding behind a berm or whatever. Uh, let's just go out. The alfalfa is kind of tall. We'll just lay down in the alfalfa and, and glass around and, and they'll come by. So they did that in one field and we, my son and I went off into a different field and just kind of, we posted up on the, the back side of the, the field where we had some, some cover behind us to break up our outline. And, uh, and right, I mean, right as it's getting to last light, when it's just getting to that time where you think like, okay, next five minutes, we should wrap it up here. I look up and here's a few deer at the fence and they're, you know, they always stop kind of by the fence while they check for danger. And then they hop over and come on into the field. And so they were coming right into the field that we were in. And so I'm watching them and I'm, I'm getting Hendrick, my son on them. And, uh, and he is experiencing for the first time that like super dump of adrenaline <laughs> when you first get an animal in your scope. Uh, cause as they were coming in, I'm like, okay, like find them in your scope, but hold on. Uh, we don't know if there's a buck in the group or not yet. And as a couple does come in and you know, you're, you're just scanning and they're, they're about, they're about 300 yards away, which is a long shot for him. Uh, he has not practiced much at that range, but, uh, but th there was not much we could do. We were at, if we waited for them to come in closer, it was going to be after dark. So, uh, as they're hopping the fence, this, this one deer hops over, I think he looks kind of big and then he picks up his head and looks around and I'm like, Oh man, he is at least a real wide, nice three. Um, so I kind of guided Hendrick and he's like, okay, yeah, I, I see him. I got him in the scope and he was so excited like i was surprised at how quickly he's like okay i'm gonna shoot I'm like whoa, 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 whoa okay okay hold on uh like take your safety you're walking through the steps and and making sure like okay you're on you're on that deer right you're on the third one from the left with the antlers okay all right good um and it's getting like it's starting to get hard to see it was like right at that like edge of like okay if you don't take the shot in the next like 30 seconds we need to not shoot um but he's all set up and he's lined up on him. And right as like, right as I give the like, okay, whenever you're ready on that deer, he, you know, the does have cleared. He's, he's, you got a clear shot, go for it. 
uh, I hear, we're both wearing hearing protection because he's got a break on his rifle, but I hear what I think sounds like a shot in the distance behind me from where my wife is. And I think to myself, was that a shot? And just as I think that, Hendrick blasts one off and I'm, I'm looking through the binoculars and I see deer scatter everywhere. But that, that buck in particular, like takes a couple steps, but then stops and looks and he's, he's not moving. The does are like spazzing out and <laughs> running all around. That buck is just kind of standing there. And I think, oh my gosh, man, did you hit him? But I also see this cloud of dust that is blowing through the air from the berm behind the deer, which would indicate to me that that's got to be a clean miss, I think, <laughs> to have that much dust. Um, and sure enough, the buck eventually like kind of took off to chase his does and they ran out of the field. Um and just about as that's all settling down and I'm, you know, congratulating Hendrick for getting his first shot and explaining like, okay, we're going to, I think you missed, but we're going to go up and check and make sure there's not any blood and, and all of that. I get a text from my wife who says like, okay, you, you want to grab the truck and come get us? I didn't hit him. And I think, oh man, that, that was a shot. And it turns out in the aftermath, as we were talking about the story, she took two shots. So I heard the first shot. Then Hendrick shot. She never ever even heard Hendrick shot because she was just so like engrossed in her own. Uh, took a second shot and they were shooting at what was apparently a one horned buck that we named Elliot from the wonderful movie Open Season, uh, which is a delight. If you haven't seen it, you should go watch it right now. Well, at the end of this episode. Anyway, uh, he had come in from kind of the corner of the field and was he was, it was a much closer shot. He was about 220, I think. And uh, what ended up happening there is, is Sarah hadn't like fully set up. Uh, she planned to lay prone. And then as the deer came in and she was like, okay, I got to get in position. She was like, oh, shoot, I can't see over the alfalfa if I'm laying down. So she had to like real quick set up, sit up and then like try to adjust her bipod to get it taller. So there was a lot of frantic stuff going on there. Uh, so by the time she executed a shot, she had missed and then follow-up shot is always a crapshoot. You never know. Um, but she had missed him. We had both missed. I did, of course, walk up with Hendrick to, to where his deer were, uh, saw all the fresh tracks and looked all around with a flashlight because it's totally dark at that point. Uh, not a single sign of blood. So it, it was a clean miss. That buck went to live on another day. Are you a new hunter or even a guy with some miles under his boots who's still just trying to figure it out? I get it. I've been there. I'm an adult onset hunter who spent the last 15 years learning how to hunt. And so I wrote the book, How to Hunt, A Total Beginner's Guide to Hunting Big Game, as the resource I wish existed all those years ago when I first started. Whether you're planning to chase elk with your bow in the west, or you're hunting for whitetails back east, this book will take you from knowing absolutely nothing to your first harvest. It's packed with hunting stories and plenty of those times where I royally screwed up, You'll leave with a sound strategy for hunting big game and have plenty of laughs along the way. Grab a copy today at latetothegameoutdoors.com slash howtohuntbook. And uh, because this is a bougie hunt, we drove back home and celebrated the milestone that is your first shot at a deer. Uh, had a nice dinner and took showers and slept and it was wonderful. The next morning... Uh, my father-in-law had to leave because he had something going early Saturday morning. Uh, and so just my wife, my son, and I went out and uh, we decided to sit on this totally different field where we had some good game cam picks. And there's sort of this, this hole in the barbed wire fence that is sort of like their main corridor in and out of the farm over on that end. And so we decided to sit where we'd be well within range of that. And theoretically, we'd see them feeding across the field. And before they left through that hole we'd get a shot on him. And as the sun comes up, we glass up these two deer that are farther away than we expected. But I'm thinking, okay, they're out there feeding. Surely they'll walk back towards that hole in the fence. Um, it's early enough and, and they're far enough that I can't even assess, okay, is one of them a small buck or is it just two does? Either way, they kept moving in the wrong direction and ultimately just came up to the fence and just decided to jump over in a totally different spot. And that was the end of the hunt. We, we hiked out of there and kind of scanned the rest of the farm, saw what I thought was a mule deer butt in this one field. Uh, and as late as it was and kind of the way the farm works, I, we were closer to the truck than the deer. So I was like, well, let's just jump with the truck. We're going to drive up and park near that field and we'll glass out and see what we see. And when we got up there, there was nothing in there. 
So either I imagined the deer butt or it took off uh, immediately, uh, which is doubtful. It's more likely I saw some piece of farm equipment at just the right angle, obscured by this other thing, and it looked like a butt. Anyway, if the hunt couldn't get any more like bougie and city-fied, uh, that Saturday morning or afternoon or all day was like the last day of all three of my kids' uh, fall sporting events. So my son had, had worked hard all season on this soccer team. Their team was actually the ranked number two in the league, and it was like the, the tournament playoff day. So there's a bracket and all this stuff, and, and he really, really, really didn't want to miss those games for a hunt, which makes me question where his priorities are. But I'm trying to be a supportive father who doesn't like cram hunting down his son's throat. So we left the morning hunt, <laughs> cleaned ourselves up. My kid changed into his soccer uniform and we drove clear back to our neck of the woods so that he could play in these two soccer games. Uh, and of course, my other kids had games and we met up with them and, and my mother-in-law who was watching the younger ones. And so we have this whole, I mean, just hours and hours of watching kids soccer games and finally, the, the tournament, the, the games wrap up with just enough time to hop in the truck, grab some food, drive all the way back out to the farmhouse, swap back into our camo, grab our rifles, head out to the farm for the evening hunt. And in that evening, we just we kind of chose two different fields. And so I went and sat where uh, my wife and father-in-law were sitting the first night. They went into a totally different field where... Uh, where it seemed like that it, it's known that like big bucks always seem to end up in that field. You just usually see them at night, like through your headlights while the farmers are turning off equipment and stuff. But they decided to sit there to see if they would maybe come in early enough. That they could get a shot at a big buck. And so I'm, I'm sitting there with, with Hendrick in the middle of this alfalfa field. He decides to try alfalfa and decides he likes it. So he's sitting there like munching on alfalfa the whole evening. Super weird. Uh, anyway, right as the sun is, you know, we're in the last half hour of, of shooting light and uh, I see these two deer come moving across the edge of our field and they're right at about like 350 and they're far enough and they're backlit from the setting sun. So I can't get a clear image as to if they're, if there's horns in the bunch or not. And, and also after the first day with the, taking the farther shot, I thought I really need to get this kid closer. So so we crawl hands and knees for a hundred yards through this alfalfa field towards these deer. And we finally close the distance to, to 220-ish yards uh, where I can see clearly that they are both does. And it was completely pointless other than having some fun and excitement of, of crawling, having my son throw, sling his rifle over his back and crawl through like, you know, every little boy's army man fantasy. Uh, but alas, no shot was able to be taken and, and Sarah and her dad didn't see anything over in that field. So the next morning, Sunday morning, and it was our last chance to hunt. Uh, I had work stuff Sunday night I had to be at the, we didn't want to like have all the little kids out super late while we finished hunting in the evening and then have to go to school. So it was Sunday morning or bust. And so we, uh, we decided to stay together and sort of we go to the same spot, execute the same plan as the very first morning, only this time before the sun even comes up, we're glassing these fields. And even in the moonlight, you can see just these dark deer shapes. And there's kind of a bunch of them off to our left. And there's at least one of them in the field off to our right. And so I quickly kind of turn to my father-in-law and just say, hey, why don't you take Sarah? Uh, you can drop down behind this berm, head on over, see if you can head off these deer over off to our left. I'm going to go with Hendrick. We're going to drop down and try to creep in on this deer over here while it's still dark. And maybe we can get away with some movement. And so we, we do exactly that. They, they head off and, and the whole time that Hendrick and I are making our way, trying to like assess how far out into this field should we go before we try to pick up this deer again. Uh, I, I don't hear any shots coming from them. So I'm, I'm getting a little worried, but, but still hoping for the best. You never know. And so as, as Hendrick and I get out to sort of the midway across this field, I, I, we post up and I start looking through the glass and the sun is just starting to come up and I can't find this deer. Like, I don't know if, if maybe even in the dark we spooked it, we weren't as stealthy as I thought we were, but I'm not seeing anything in this field. And then suddenly back in the far corner <laughs> from, the, from the direction we had just come, 
uh, I see this this deer, and it's now light enough that I can like make out some detail, and I'm I'm looking at him and and just trying to like assess, and so we we move a little bit, uh, like head back the direction we had come, we try not to spook him, but we're trying to move quickly, and so we close the distance to where he is under 300 yards, which is still far. Uh, but uh, I'm glassing and I'm still not sure it's a buck and, and I just keep staring and he keeps moving and there's something about, every time he moves, I'm like, there's, there's something there, but it's not, it's not the normal, you, you know, you kind of get used to the picture of the deer turns its head and you see the, the rack sticking up there and there's something besides ears moving around. And finally I catch an angle where I can see, oh my gosh, this is Elliot, the one antler deer that my wife shot at. Uh, and he's right there in the corner of the field. And unfortunately, he's he's at an angle. He's making his way to the edge where he's going to be at the edge of the property. He's going to hop the fence. He's going to be off into the desert and he's going to be gone. So I tell Hendrick, oh, man, that's that's a buck. That's Elliot. He's back. Uh, take your shot if you're ready. <laughs> and so we set them all up and all the usual stuff. And uh, this time, since it's a little lighter than last time, I, I have a better eye as to where his misses are hitting. Uh, but he, he shoots once. And it is way low, like the alfalfa way in front <laughs> in my memory. It's almost midway between us and the deer that alfalfa, uh, rustles with the bullet. Uh, so I'm like, okay, that was, that was way low. Aim a little high. Cause now, you know, he's, he's pushing 300 yards away. So, uh, and the kid is zeroed at 200. So aim a little high. You'll be all right. Uh, he shoots again, misses way high, like big puff of smoke in the the dirt berm behind the deer uh like his his right to left was pretty solid but just way high and of course the deer at this point is is moving around you know kind of running and stopping and looking and trying to figure out what's going on uh hendrick is just cycling through rounds he he gets the the third round jacked in and the deer stops again in front of this berm and i'm like okay just you know all the stuff you try to encourage your kid with in the middle of that intense moment. Uh, and just, you know, slow squeeze, all the, trying to remind him of all the fundamentals. He squeezes off another one. This one, he finally had uh, adjusted his elevation perfectly, but the there was a puff of smoke behind the deer's butt. So he missed way left. Uh, he told me later that he was just, at that point, he was just swinging the rifle. Uh, and as soon as he saw deer in the scope he squeezed the trigger which is obviously not what i would want him to do but it's what happened in the moment uh and as he was trying to put a fourth round in the deer had gone under a fence he was standing on top of this the farm road took one last look back and then dove off the side uh of the hill out of sight and we never saw him again we of course like packed up our stuff and we we walked along the road and we checked for, for tracks and for blood. And, and there was this kind of retention basin that he had kind of dove in, dove, dived. Uh, when he left the road, he went down into this thing. And so we went around to the other side and we could see like where he, his muddy tracks had come up through. So we knew his routes and there was zero blood. So three, three clean misses. Elliot lives to fight another day. Um, obviously by then. Uh, there were no more deer hanging out of the farm since shots had been ringing out. Uh, my wife said that when they, their story was they walked down this berm, tried to head off these deer. It was still pretty dark. Like they, they couldn't be sure if there was a buck in the group or not. And then as the sun was coming up and as they were moving, they had hopped the fence. There's this railroad track that runs right along the edge of the farm property. And so as one of the deer like crested up on top of the tracks and turned his head, they saw, oh, yep, sure enough, that's that's a good-sized buck. And then he tore off into the desert and, and was gone forever. And that was the end of that hunt. We we had to pack up and go get our kids and and go back to regular, normal life. Um, the, the tag was still open for the rest of the week. But life being what it is, we didn't have any time to get out there and, and do that. And honestly, I asked my there was one evening we could have pulled it off. And I asked my son if he wanted to go. And he said, no, I'm not. You know, I feel like I did. I, I I gave it a good shot. I no pun intended, but like, I'm I'm not really feeling like I want to go back out there right now. And oh, took everything in me not to force him to go out there, but <laughs> but he he took his first shots. He was excited. Uh, he's got a javelina tag that he drew for this 
upcoming February. And we're going to put some more time into that than we have in the past and see if we can get them on a pig. And between now and then, we're obviously going to spend a lot of time out at the range, getting him more comfortable, more dialed in. Uh, because if he was missing a deer by that much, a pig is much smaller. Uh, and I want to set the kid up for success. So that is the tale of our uh, family bougie super kush hunt that sadly didn't put any meat in the freezer, but uh, had a lot of excitement, a lot of action. Bullets were flying. Uh, it was a good time for sure. What is yet to be accomplished is my wife and son have yet to put an animal on the ground. And uh, they, they need to have that rite of passage. So they both actually have javelina tags this February. Maybe we can get them both on one of those and at least check that off the list. And then we can move them on to bigger, more exciting animals. Not that javelina aren't exciting. They're, they're wonderful, fun to hunt animals. I have an archery javelina tag coming my way that's going to overlap uh, archery deer hunting in, in January. It's going to be superb. Super excited. So thank you for listening as always. Uh, if you haven't yet, please subscribe. If you'd be so kind as to leave a, a rating and a review, it really just helps move the podcast along. And I say this pretty regularly, but 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 honestly, if you have a great hunting story, I, I would love to hear it. I don't want these to just be my stories. I want to collect stories from from all over the country, all over. I've had guests from Canada. Uh, like, there's different things that we hunt in different ways in different terrains. Like, I want to get all that out there. If it's a good hunting story, I want to hear it, and, and if if possible, put it on the show. So. You can find all the info at late to the game outdoors.com. You can reach out on Instagram, late to the game outdoors. Uh, I'm, I'm hard to not find. So, so reach out, get a hold of me. I will try to get back to you and, and we'll see if we can get some more stories from all over the place here on the podcast. Thanks again, and we'll be back in just a little bit. Thanks so much for tuning in to Hunting Stories. And if you want to stay up on what we're doing with the podcast or anything else going on with Late to the Game, go ahead and check us out at latetothegameoutdoors.com or give us a follow on Instagram at latetothegameoutdoors. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you guys next time.